Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, moving from relational model, excuse me, data modeling and relational to NoSQL. Sponsored today by Couchbase. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be clicking them by the Q&A section in the bottom middle hand of your, or excuse me, in the bottom middle of your screen for that feature. And if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. To access the Q&A or the chat panels, you can find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Matthew Groves. Matthew is a guy who loves to code. It doesn't matter if it's C Sharp, jQuery, or PHP. He'll submit he'll submit pull requests for anything. He has been coding professionally ever since he wrote a quick basic point of sale app for his parents' pizza shop back in the 90s. And he currently works as a developer advocate for Couchbase. And with that, I will give the floor to Matthew to get to today's webinar started and the first webinar of 2022 for Dataversity. Hello and welcome. Thank you very much and happy New Year's to everybody. I'm going to go ahead and try to share my screen here and we'll get started. So welcome everyone. We're gonna talk about some data modeling and specifically making the move from relational to NoSQL. And we'll talk about uh, making that move into the cloud mainly as well. But uh, everything I'm talking about here can apply to the cloud or on-premises if you're, if you're still doing that. We'll talk about Couchbase a little bit today. Couchbase uh, server, it's a modern distributed NoSQL database that uh, fuses the strengths of relational. Uh, with JSON flexibility and scale. Now, databases to me are like languages. It's good to know more than one of them. Uh, fortunately, Couchbase is multilingual. It's a multi-model NoSQL database that supports, as you can see here, uh, documents. So your standard JSON data, a key value. So that includes JSON, but also any other type of uh, data you want to store. Full text search for obviously uh, searching through words, but also searching uh, by geography. Um, analytics, so doing uh, HTAP or, or HOPE, however you want to refer to it, type of uh, queries. Uh, mobile, uh, referred to here as edge database, so that's uh, offline capable synchron uh, synchronizing data to mobile devices and to the edge. And as we're going to see today, we're going to focus on relational style data modeling. Uh, and that uh, falls under the document database purview here. Um, uh, because I think Couchbase is very uniquely suited for handling the same style of data. And uh, as we're going to see with the newer versions of Couchbase, uh, the same type of use cases. So with that in mind, let's uh, talk about uh, the goal, uh, your, your goals. Uh, so we want to identify if uh, what I'm going to cover today is going to be useful to you. Uh, so a, ben a use case that can benefit from moving to Couchbase, for instance, a, a user profile, session store, catalog, or any kind of content management, um, uh, customer 360, uh, mobile, as I just mentioned, and even things like large-scale uh, finance and, and fintech use cases can really benefit uh, from a modern database. And so your goal then might be uh, to get some or all of your data uh, from a legacy database onto a modern database, uh, maybe a portion of your data. You just maybe want a slice, a microservice, for instance, uh, to run on a modern database, or it may be a, a brand new service, or maybe the whole thing. Uh, and, and you want to be able to switch your application or, or you know, switch a part of your application or building a whole new application. Uh, those are all going to apply here. And uh, we wanna also talk about optimizing your data model. So we're not just moving from relational to Couchbase and leaving the data as is. There are some things we can do to change the data model uh, and or change the way we access that data to meet performance goals. Uh, you know, if, if we're not making any progress, we're not receiving any benefit, then uh, what is the point of, of just switching from one database to another? Um, so we're going to look at some ways to optimize that as well, as, as well as some things that you, you get just by switching to Couchbase in the first place. So we've got uh, three steps I wanna to cover today. Uh, we're going to look at how to map data from relational into Couchbase, which uh, thanks to some of the newer Couchbase features is relatively straightforward, but we'll see how that works. We're gonna look at how to shift your application code over. And I think, uh, again, Couchbase is 
uh, uniquely suited to this. And you know, no, no database is a plug and play switch, all right? But uh, there are lots of things that Couchbase, uh, lots of capabilities that Couchbase has that makes this uh, much easier to do than others. And we'll look at optimizing. So what are some things we can do once we're in Couchbase to improve performance, uh, to make a data access more efficient and so on. So we'll look, look at that today. We're just gonna scratch the surface uh, a lot today. So if you have questions, I'd be glad to uh, answer those. Just throw them into the Q&A tab there and we'll get to those later. <clears throat> I'll answer as many as I can. And if I can't answer them completely, I'll try to point you to some resources. All right, so let's look at mapping from relational. And so you might say, why now? Why are we looking at mapping uh, from relational to Couchbase uh, right now? And I think uh, one of the big parts of that is Couchbase 7, uh, which is also featured in our new uh, database as a service, service offering called Couchbase Capella, which I'm going to show today. And this makes it easier than ever to bring uh, your relational data into a, a modern database or even to a fully managed uh, database as a service or DBAS. Uh, Couchbase has, a, has concepts called scopes and collections now, which provide organizational building blocks that these are akin to uh, schemas and tables in the relational world. They're not exactly the same, but it's a very uh, similar concept that we can match to. And Couchbase is distributed, so uh, asset transactions are a relatively new feature as well. It means you can fall back to relational style modeling where you have data in several pieces when you need to do that. And then Nickel, which is uh, also known as SQL++, this is Couchbase's query language. It's been around a long time, but it continues to mature with Couchbase. Uh, including things like uh, user-defined functions and uh, begin commit rollback for transactions. But everything is there uh, in SQL, uh, select, insert, update, delete, merge, common table expressions, joins, aggregations. Those are all there and have been battle tested for a while in Couchbase. So you might just be asking the question now, if you're not familiar with Couchbase, is it, is it just a relational database now? Uh, have we just reinvented that? And I would say that Couchbase has is, becoming, is attempting to become a fusion of the best of both worlds. So we can do relational style things now in Couchbase. Yeah, I mentioned acid and joins, things like that. But the core focus of Couchbase remains these things here on the screen, right? We wanna be distributed to provide high availability and scalability, uh, flexible. So we're still storing data as JSON uh, and memory first. So there's still a built-in cache in Couchbase. Um, uh, manage cache uh, is part of Couchbase to provide uh, faster performance. So those things are still part of Couchbase. With that in mind, uh, I've created this kind of a, a translation dictionary, a SQL to Couchbase dictionary that helps you to map the concepts from something you're familiar with, legacy relational, to a modern database. Uh, Couchbase is listed here. So I'm not going to go through all of these in detail here, but uh, if we look at a legacy database, it's runs on a server, right? When a modern database is gonna run on a clustering, a collection of servers that are networked to get together. Now, these are roughly the same from an organizational or developer point of view, but by switching to a cluster, we add scalability. So we can keep adding uh, additional machines to that cluster, additional servers to the cluster to gain scalability and high availability. If a server uh, in the cluster goes down, the, the server or the cluster can stay online. Uh, at the database level, uh, you know, a server can have multiple databases and a cluster can have multiple buckets. But at the bucket level, we can say, uh, we can define replication. We can say, how much do we want to replicate the data in this bucket? Uh, you know, the more replication, uh, the better, of course, but there's trade-offs to that. And then caching as well. So we can define at the bucket level how much RAM we want to give uh, to the managed cache. Uh, a schema is very much like a scope in Couchbase. Uh, if, you're, if you're like me and you come from a uh, relational background, you may not have seen uh, schema used too much. Uh, you might just be used to seeing DBO, for instance, in the SQL world. And in Couchbase, there's also an underscore default, same kind of thing. But schemas and scopes can be used to manage microservices or multi-tenancy, for instance. Uh, a, a table and a collection is probably where one of the biggest differences come into play. They're roughly the same level of organization. But with a collection in Couchbase, we don't have to define a schema up front. We don't have to say, well, it has to follow these specific columns and these specific data types. So we gain flexibility there. And that's because inside of a collection, there are uh, one or more documents. And those documents are JSON data. And they're not uh, coupled to each other. Uh, so there's no uh, tight coupling between the pieces of data in the collection. And that helps with the di distribution as well. Um, and then uh, in the SQL world, I mentioned this already, but uh, SQL++ and Couchbase is akin to, say, Transact SQL in SQL Server. 
uh, and it's a full implementation, as I mentioned. So it's not just a SQL-like language, it's a full SQL implementation. Uh, most tables and like in relational have a primary key and every document in, or every, sorry, every row has a primary key value. And then every document in Couchbase has a document key value. And then of course, indexes are there to help uh, with performance on the SQL queries. All right, and I'm working personally on this project called SQL Server to Couchbase. This is a, a .NET library um, that helps uh, developers move from SQL Server to Couchbase. Now, even if you don't use .NET or SQL Server, the same principles still apply to any, any relational database. And I'm actually trying to work on uh, getting this to support other relational databases like Oracle or MySQL, for instance, in the future. But for right now, it's SQL Server. And so I'll be uh, going over some of those principles in that project. If you're interested in learning more about this project, I'll give you a link towards the end at GitHub where you can check it out, make suggestions, try it out, submit issues, that sort of thing. Some other tools that are very similar, take similar approaches, um, they, these range anywhere from a fully, uh, com full commercially supported tool like GlueSync uh, that actually allows real-time synchronization between Couchbase and uh, SQL Server and Oracle, for instance, uh, which is very cool. You don't have to uh, get rid of SQL Server, at least not right away. You can start synchronizing data between them, which allows you to dip into those modern capabilities without uh, getting rid of your legacy database, at least not right away. My project is most similar to something called Couchgress, which is an open source community project as well. And it's just migrating from Postgres to Couchbase, same approach. Uh, and so the last approach then is, is kind of the more of bare bones, do it yourself, DIY script based approach where you can export data into CSV files and then import CSV into Couchbase via UI or command line, something like that. So there's a whole range of options here. Uh, they'll fit your budget or your requirements and, and everything in between. So I wanna show a quick demo here of some mapping. I'm not gonna go through the whole uh, process because it, it does take a little bit of time for this kind of thing to run and, and we don't have that kind of time and it's kind of boring to sit and watch. So just wanna show you a quick example of, of what's going on here. So let's start with a uh, SQL Server database I have running here locally. This is an older version of SQL Server, but um, you know, based on my experience, this is probably a version that uh, many of you are still using, in fact. But this is a sample database called AdventureWorks. You're probably familiar with that. And it contains many uh, tables, uh, schemas, uh, and lots of data. So you can see just some of the schemas here are human resources, person, uh, production, and so on. And then within those schemas, there are tables. So the person schema has address, address type, business entity, and so on. And we can query the data with SQL. As you can see right here, I'm querying the address table and we'll get uh, results here from the address table. So just a bunch of addresses that correspond to, um, I assume to a person or entity of, of some kind. All right. So we've got all these tables here, all these scopes and schemas, and I can map these to all those couch basic concepts, as I mentioned earlier with, the, with that dictionary. So this is the utility that I've written. This is the configuration for it. And I'm just going to connect to SQL Server, uh, which is running locally. I'm connecting to uh, Couchbase Capella, which is running out in the cloud. But of course, you could also connect it to a, a local Couchbase or on-premises Couchbase or whatever. Uh, and you give it a bucket name. And there's a bunch of other information here I'm not going to go over. But what this will do is it will go into this Couchbase server, and it will create a scope for every schema it finds in SQL Server. It will create a collection for every table it finds in SQL Server, and then it will start moving data over. It will turn rows into JSON documents. Now I've actually done this ahead of time. So uh, I'll just refresh here to make sure I'm still logged in and to Couchbase Capella. And this is the online uh, database as a service uh, version of Couchbase called Capella. But of course we also have Couchbase Server that you can run locally if you want to. Uh, but Couchbase Capella has a, a nice free trial going on right now. So I'll give you more details on that towards the end. This is uh, the bucket I've created called AdventureWorks. Just one bucket here for now. Let's go into the scopes. You can see I've already, it, my utility in fact, has already created all these different scopes here, like a person and uh, purchasing human resources and so on that correspond to those schemas. And if I go into... Uh, one of these scopes, you can see that there are collections that correspond to the tables in SQL Server. So there's a person collection, password, email address, and so on. Let's go ahead and go into that address one we were looking at. So look at the documents here. 
And so this is, these are the actual documents in that collection. You see ID one here, you can see that we've got this address with ID one that is um, uh, 1970 Napa Court, and that's ID one. That's all in JSON data format there. If we go back over here, you can see we've got uh, address ID one is 1970 Napa Court, and it's got spatial location, which gets translated to JSON and so on there. So we've roughly just kind of lifted and shifted the data from uh, our relational database into Couchbase. We haven't done anything to change the modeling. We've just moved the data over completely. It's now stored in JSON format uh, with a document ID instead of a primary key, but the same data is there and ready to be used in our modern Couchbase database. And I can also, if I wanted to run some queries on this, and uh, I don't know if this is going to, uh, I'm not going to necessarily run this because I haven't, uh, I didn't prepare this ahead of time, uh, a query, but uh, if we go person.address and let's just say limit 10, let's see what happens here. Uh, field person. Okay. So probably because it needs to be AdventureWorks 2016, something like that. Uh, no, no index. Yeah. So I need to uh, put a where on there. So probably where. Let's see, a dot address ID is not missing. And let's see if that runs. There we go. So I can just run a SQL query and return. Instead of uh, tables uh, and rows, I can get JSON data. I can put it in table format if I want to. Um, it's a little more interesting sometimes to see it in this view. Uh, we've got kind of an embedded object here in spatial location, but uh, you can see it's roughly uh, the same type of query language. And I'll show more examples of this later. Uh, in fact, coming up next, uh, about how uh, Couchbase makes this easier to transition. Okay, so we've got our uh, data moved over from uh, SQL Server into Couchbase. And so that's a relatively straightforward, easy step. It may take some time, depending on how much data you have. Um, but the next thing is we want to we wanna move the, the application code over, the, the, the code that actually connects reads and writes from the database. And again, this goes back to your goals. Are you creating a brand new service, or are you uh, changing an existing one or changing part of an existing service? Uh, so if so, uh, you're going to need to make changes to the parts of that uh, service or that code that use the relational database. And so the things you need to shift, the tools you need to make that shift over is, is as follows, uh, is an SDK first and foremost, and this is whatever language your software is written with, uses an SDK to connect to a database. Now Couchbase has, officially supported SDKs for 10 languages and then some beta and community support for other languages. But uh, most of the popular ones you'd expect to hear, Java, Node, Ruby, .NET, C, PHP, and, and so on are all listed there. So you can use those to connect to Couchbase. The second thing is SQL. If you're refactoring an existing application, much of it that interacts with the database is probably gonna consist of SQL queries that your team has written over the years. Uh, and so the question might be, do we have to rewrite all of that? I think the answer from many of Couchbase's competitors is yes. You basically have to rewrite in a, in a new query language and start over from scratch. Now, Couchbase's answer is you can use and maybe reuse existing SQL. I'll show you an example of what I mean uh, here in the next couple of slides. And the last thing is uh, acid transactions. Now, for, for a long time, this has been an Achilles heel of distributed databases, but uh, there's been no asset transaction support, but Couchbase now has asset transaction support. So if you want to keep your data in multiple pieces, like relational style data, uh, you can still have asset transaction support uh, to make sure that data uh, is updated reliably and consistently. So let me give you an example of SQL and uh, what kind of reuse you can, you can expect. Uh, Couchbase has supported SQL for many, many years. So if you're already using SQL, this isn't going to change very much. And that's going to make the transition uh, smoother, I think. Many databases claim a SQL-like language, but Couchbase's language, SQL++ or Nickel, is on a whole other level. So for instance, this is a query from official Microsoft documentation about T-SQL, which is a SQL Server implementation of SQL. And this query returns all employees from AdventureWorks and the cities that they live in. And this is, I think, a non-trivial example of SQL, at least that'll fit on the slide. Uh, there's multiple joins happening here. Uh, there is a subquery. There is ordering going on. There are multiple tables involved. There's multiple schemas involved. 
uh, there's string functions. So we've got the trims up there and there's concatenation. We've got uh, putting a space in between the first name and last name. Now I, I went ahead and converted this query over to Couchbase. Uh, Couchbase is SQL plus plus or, or nickel language. And this is a, returns the same, same exact results now in JSON format instead of a result set. But there's a slight difference in syntax and uh, I'm gonna give you a, a second to put your guess into the chat box there of what that difference is. Uh, if you can actually spot that difference. If you blinked, you might've missed it. Now, I, I do wanna make the point that uh, this isn't always going to be this easy, right? It's not going to be always a matter of just copying and pasting a query and it'll work. However, you do get a pretty good head start towards modernization and you're using a, a language that most developers in your organization already know SQL. You know, probably one of the top three, certainly languages in the world, uh, period and certainly the most popular language for dealing with data. And it looks like some of you in the chat have gotten it correctly. Uh, so instead of using the plus symbol for concatenation, which is what SQL Server uses, uh, SQL++ uses uh, double pipes uh, for concatenation, which I think is what Oracle uses as well, or MySQL uses for concatenation. So, um, you know, SQL or T-SQL sometimes has some different uh, uh, syntax Right, so uh, another example, for instance, SQL, I'm a SQL Server developer from way back. So um, to, do, to do paging, I used to have to use the top keyword, you know, select top 100. Uh, when I first discovered MySQL uh, and Oracle, it was there was a limit. Uh, you could use the limit uh, keyword for paging, which I found to be much, much better. And actually that's what Couchbase uses is the limit and offset sort of thing. Someone's saying that plus is not ANSI standard. Uh, I, I think that's probably correct. Uh, you know, most uh, relational databases claim to be ANSI standard, but there's usually some minor, at least minor variations and additional uh, keywords that are that are non-standard. So that's that's pretty much par for the course amongst uh, SQL implementations. The next thing I want to look at is ACID transactions. So here is an example of a uh, SQL Server uh, ACID transaction being run from C Sharp. Now, if you're not familiar with .NET, C Sharp, SQL Server is totally fine. Um, it's not important uh, for uh, our purposes today, but there are basically three parts of this code that are, are key for a ACID transaction. And one is to actually create and start a transaction. So that's what we're seeing here. This is using a, a tool called Entity Framework, start the transaction. And then you perform some set of data operations, you know, usually at least two, <laughs> uh, could be more. And at the end of that, you save those changes and then you commit the transaction, assuming everything goes well. You say, all right, I'm all, I'm all done now. Make sure all these operations complete. And if something goes wrong in the middle, if they don't all, or if they're not all able to be completed, then there's a rollback that can happen. Uh, in this case, it's happening during a exception, but it can happen any other time as well. If, you know, based on some custom logic, it's totally fine. So those are the three main parts of an asset transaction, begin, commit, uh, and or rollback. Let's look over at the uh, C-sharp example using Couchbase server. And again, I've left out uh, some of the data manipulation pieces here, so it fits on the slide, but there's basically the same three parts. And, and one of them here is creating this transaction object. Now, um, there are some different settings to think about because we're talking about this is a distributed database instead of a single server, but there are sensible defaults here. And there's a commit. Now, in this case, uh, the API here is inside of a Lambda. So the commit can be, um, implicit, but you can also make it explicit if you want to. You can say context.commit. And the same thing for rollback. It's uh, also implicit. If there's an exception, then a rollback automatically happens. But you can also say context.rollback if you want to. But it's the same three parts there. So it's, uh, de you know, developers don't need to create your own transaction framework or you don't have to work around those asset limitations with the modern database anymore. So what does this all mean? It means it's not going to be an overnight process to modernize. It's not just a, a drop-in replacement for a relational database. But with Couchbase, it's going to be weeks or a few months instead of years and years with uh, other database options. So I want to take a look at some of the code here uh, beyond the slide, a uh, more complete example just to show you this in action. And I've got here in this... Um, the same GitHub repository, which I'll give you a link to at the end. I've got a web API project uh, for SQL Server and I've got one for Couchbase. And so here is an, an endpoint I wanna look at here. It's called a get person by ID. Now I'm using entity framework, but I wanted to show the actual raw SQL because ultimately 
if even if you're using link behind the scenes is still generating SQL. So I wanted to show this in action here. This is a, a way to select a person, a given a person ID gets passed into this query and that returns uh, a, a single result um, as a person class or an object of type person. All right, if I go over and look at the uh, Couchbase version of that, there's a few other things here again, because we're distributed and I can probably refactor this to slim it down. But the main thing I wanna focus on here is this SQL query. It's pretty much the same thing, some slight syntax differences, right? It's a dollar sign here. Uh, and this query options, we're passing in the person ID via that query options. But it's the same sort of uh, approach, selecting uh, from SQL and returning a object of type person. And let's look at a more complex example using ACID. So I've got this back in SQL Server code here. I've got this update person endpoint here, and it has an API called person update API. Let's see if we can go to that real quick. Uh, Yep, so this API is very simple. It allows you to update a person's name, a first name, last name, and an email address of that person. Now in our SQL server, remember that a person's name and a person's email address are in two different tables. So if we wanna update both those at the same time, we have to do that inside of an asset transaction. So we've got this begin transaction here. We're gonna find the person, we're gonna find the email, and we're going to make changes to that person, make changes to the email, save those changes, commit the transaction. If something goes wrong, you can roll back the transaction. Again, I, I just do it in case of an exception, but you can be more explicit if you want to. All right, let's look at the Couchbase example here. I've got a similar endpoint called update person, and there's the same object here, person update API. So it's the same exact API. And again, we've just moved the data as it is in the Couchbase. So we still have the person data in one document and the email address data in another document. So because it's two different documents, we need to update them within a transaction. So I'm creating a transaction object, starting a transaction Lambda here. We're gonna get that uh, person out and make changes to the person, get the email out, make changes to the email and replace those pieces of data and return okay. Now, notice there is not a explicit context dot uh, commit in here, but I certainly could do that if I wanted to. And there's not a explicit rollback um, just because I'm only uh, doing a rollback in case of an exception being thrown. So that's just implicitly happening there. But certainly if you need to have more complex logic, you can put those within uh, ifs and elses and, and shifts and what or uh, selects and whatnot. All right, so there we go. So we've got a very much similar approaches uh, in the modern uh, database and the relational database, but uh, we've gained a lot just from switching to that modern database in terms of uh, building caching and JSON flexibility and so on. So all we've done at this point is, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of work to switch our application over, but we have switched our data over and switched our application over. Next thing we need to think about is optimization because there are some things that a modern database can do that your relational legacy database uh, really can't. So one of the things we need to think about, and this is kind of the main thing when it comes to data modeling in, the, in a JSON database or a modern database is when to consolidate. You know, relational style data is spread out, right? We mentioned the person and the email addresses are in separate tables, it's in separate pieces. So in order to uh, get that together, we have to uh, join those pieces of data, those, those tables. And to update them, we have to uh, use ACID transactions if we want to update them both at the same time. And those things introduce overhead. And especially in a distributed database, it, it, that's overhead has to be, uh, you know, it requires more overhead because we have more servers in the mix. And the two pieces of data could be on two different machines for all we know. So what we can do in a JSON data model is we can actually choose to denormalize data when it makes sense to. Now, uh, my, my point of view on this is basically denormalize uh, until it stops making sense to denormalize. And that, in, that requires a, some human thought. So this can't be completely automated, but once you make a decision about when it makes sense to denormalize data, then we can automate the actual mechanics of doing that. So let me show you an example here. So when I copy some data directly from relational to Couchbase, it stays in this relational style format. Person is a single document represented by a JSON object there. 
and person can have multiple email addresses. Each email address is its own document as well. So these are two documents here. If the person has more email addresses, there would be you know, two email address documents or three or four, whatever. Now, I don't have to keep it this way. Uh, in fact, keeping this way can be performance detriment, as I mentioned, because I have to use join when I want to select a person and their email address. And I may have to use an asset transaction when I update both of these at the same time. Now, you can keep it like this. Couchbase does support those things, asset and joins. Um, but you may want to consolidate to meet those performance goals and, and maybe just to simplify. Now, in my utility, once you made the determination that, yeah, I want to uh, combine email address in a person, I think that makes sense. Then you can just specify which tables are combined and the end result is going to look like this. So now there's a single consolidated person document. Uh, you no longer have to use a join because the data is already right there inside the person. Uh, you don't even have to use um, ACID to make a change, right? Because it's just one document. So just updating one piece of data in Couchbase is always going to be ACID compliant. And you don't have to use uh, uh, nickel even to get this data. If, if we know the key ahead of time, we know one, two, three, we can just get that with a, uh, a key value operation, which is something that you can't do in the uh, relational world. So if we make this change, our application has millions of users, and let's say they're often updating their profile, not just email address, they have other preferences, they want to update uh, their purchase history, all kinds of things that a profile would want to keep track of. Uh, and if we're talking millions of users, We've just eliminated millions of joins, millions of asset transactions, lots and lots of overhead, and improved performance with one simple data model refactor. Now, I mentioned this in the last slide, but with relational databases, SQL is the only way to interact with data. So I have to write a SQL query to return data no matter, no matter what it is, All right? So an example here is if I want person whose ID is 123, I have to say select, you know, star, probably shouldn't use star, but select star from person where person ID equals one, two, three. And that's the only way I can get that data out. And you can do the same thing in Couchbase. You can write the same exact query in Couchbase to get that person by their ID. But uh, Couchbase is multi-model, as I mentioned earlier on. It can function as a key value database. And so that one, two, three is the key. So we can look up that data by just writing this piece of code here. We can say get. Uh, by ID, one, two, three. And that's always going to be the fastest way to retrieve a single piece of data. We don't have to go through a query engine or a query parser, any indexing. It can just go right to looking up that data by its key. And it's going to, in Couchbase, it's going to go to the cache first to get that data, the managed cache. So if that data is in the cache already, and uh, you, can, you have control over whether, uh, you know, how much memory you want to give to Couchbase, it's going to pull it right from memory, which is super fast. So we're going from potentially microseconds or, you know, heaven forbid, seconds down to a, a sub millisecond or it's not sub millisecond, but millisecond operation to get that piece of data. And if we've already merged uh, or consolidated our email address and phone number and so on, then we have uh, gone from uh, a lot of extra overhead and work to a very quick key value lookup operation. So we can reduce latency, we can reduce pressure on the query service. So we can't always, we can't always eliminate every query, but certainly we can reduce pressure on the query service to leave it to do the work for where we do need the query service. This is a C-sharp example on the right, but again, similar APIs are available for all of the Couchbase supported SDK. So Java, Node, PHP, Python, so on, they're all there. And I just wanna restate, you can keep the version on the left if you want but the version on the right is going to be better performance almost all the time. So a uh, quick example of this. And again, uh, my utility has already done this. Um, actually, one of the configuration settings here is I can say, all right, I want to uh, consolidate a many to one mapping uh, from the email address table to the person table. And the foreign key is business entity ID. So I've given it this configuration and it can do the rest. It can go ahead and, and match up each row of that uh, email address data and embed it into its uh, person, its parent object. Sometimes this is called the aggregate root, if you're familiar with the domain-driven design type of modeling. And we're going to combine those pieces of data together. Now I've already done this ahead of time. So let's go back over here and, oh, not there. Uh, we'll go to, uh, I'll say collections and we'll go to person collection and the person, sorry, person scope, 
and the person collection. And here's all the data that's in there, um, at least five rows of it anyway. And zoom into this uh, document here. So this is person with ID one and notice lines, let's say two through 14 come from that person table. And then 15 through 25, that comes from the uh, phone number table. And then 26 through 34 come from the email addresses table. But notice that person's phone is an array of JSON. So we could have more than one uh, phone number there. Email address, also an array. We can have more than one email address. There is some data in here that I would call uh, vestigial. Uh, so for instance, the uh, online 17 and 28, it's still got the foreign keys in there just because I've copied it as is into there, but those can be removed um, because it's no longer a foreign key. It's now domestic data. So we can just remove that from there. If you know, if we're running a cleanup process, for instance, we could do that. Um, but there you go. So that's how we can uh, consolidate data. And I'll also, I just wanna uh, just uh, remind you is that this is optional. You don't have to do this with all of your data in, um, in Couchbase. You can keep the data separately, absolutely. A question just came in, using your example, when is the overhead for say 20 email addresses? I need to update just one. It's a very good question. I don't get into it usually in this presentation, but we've got a little extra time. Uh, so one thing that Couchbase offers is what's called a, a sub document uh, API. So uh, in your case, if we have 20 email addresses in there, which would be pretty crazy for one person to have 20 email addresses, but I guess not impossible, but we only wanna update one of them. With the sub document API, we can identify just a portion of the documents, we can say, okay, I just wanna update this email address here. And that means it's not gonna pull this entire document across the wire, just for you to make one little change to this field, for instance. And then it's not going to send the whole thing back across the wire. It's just going to be the minimum part that you need to update it. And you may pull the entire email addresses array or just one item from the array. Either way, you're going to work with just the minimum amount of data that you need. And so that will absolutely reduce your overhead to just the minimum you need to update one part of the document. Same thing if I wanted to update, like, um, I don't know, uh, let's say uh, Ken needs to change his last name, for instance. Uh, we, could, we don't have to pull the whole document over just to update last name. We could pull just this one part, uh, see what it is, and we could update just this one part. So that's absolutely possible to do with, uh, with Couchbase. Some other databases also have this, but Couchbase calls it sub-document API. It might be called other things in other databases, but that's what you wanna look for if you're trying to look into that. That does have an effect on data modeling, absolutely, because now it makes it a little easier for you to decide, well, should I embed all those things, even if it makes the document really big? It's okay because I can update the parts as I need to without uh, having to tra you know, transfer the whole document across the wire every time. Really good question. Okay. Uh, all right, so uh, let's go back over to the slides here. We're going to just kind of wrap up here. Um, I've got some next steps for you. If you wanna, if this has intrigued you and you wanna check it out yourself, one thing I'd start with is the Couchbase Playground. Go to couchbase.live. And these are ready to run examples right there in your browser. No download required. You don't have to create an account if you don't want to. You can just start running those examples. There is something, uh, you can sign up for a 30 minute session if you want to play with the same database. Uh, for 30 minutes. Uh, you can, again, you don't have to leave your browser. You can do it right there, totally free. Um, and you can, uh, so there's examples in all those languages I mentioned. So Java, .NET, PHP, C++, Go, et cetera. They're all there. Ultimately, you can connect that playground to your Capella trial. So the next step is if you want to try Couchbase Capella, there's a free 30-day trial going on right now. Just go to cloud.couchbase.com slash sign up. Completely self-service tutorial. Uh, it has some sample data it comes with, and you can also import data from CSV or JSON if you want to. You can connect it to your playground and start coding that way. So again, you don't have to leave your browser if you don't want to, but you can connect it as, as I've done here to you know, a co some code running on your local machine uh, and uh, interact with Couchbase Capella that way. And then after you're done with that trial, if you wanna keep going with Couchbase, there are some pay-as-you-go models. There's different uh, developer uh, options there and production options there starter kits and so on. So uh, that's what you can do to check it out. So start with couchbase.live and once you're ready to play with it some more uh, um, uh, to, do, to do maybe a, a proof of concept or something, you can go to uh, cloud.couchbase.com and keep going there. If you're interested in that 
um, library that I'm working on. I would love to hear any of your feedback. I would love to hear your criticisms, truly. Uh, if you want to go there and just open an issue, some of the best uh, work I've done has, has sprouted from someone uh, entering an issue and saying, hey, what about this? Can I do this? Or, hey, why doesn't it do this? Or it should do this. Uh, I welcome that kind of stuff. Uh, so go to github.com slash mgroves, SQL Server to Couchbase. Uh, that's, that's what it's called right now. It may change its name if I start adding other databases. Um, but uh, please go there and check it out. I, I'd love to hear your feedback. Um, so I have time for questions now. Thank you very much, everybody. And again, Happy New Year, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, happy to answer any questions we've got. Matthew, thank you so much for kicking off the Dataversity webinar new year it was such a great webinar. Just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will get a follow-up email to everybody by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording of the webinar. Um, there was an email or a question that came in early here. Um, can you add and remove nodes for a cluster on the fly? Can I scale up and down on demand? Uh, so uh, can you add or remove nodes on the fly? Uh, based right. on demand. So um, uh, I, I guess there's two answers here. So uh, if you want to automate that, I'm not sure if that's automatable yet with Capella, but certainly you can add nodes to it on the fly. Yes. If you go in there and you can either add them via the web UI, I think maybe there may be a REST API you can use to do that as well. And certainly um, if you want, if you want to explore Couchbase on Kubernetes, there is uh, something called a Couchbase autonomous operator that allows you to uh, do that automatically. Uh, so you can scale up and down based on certain, uh, you know, um, performance measures or uh, quotas, things like that in your Kubernetes cluster. And that of course, you, you, you would have a lot more control and a lot more responsibility, but you can certainly do that and then run that in any Kubernetes provider, AKS or uh, EKS or uh, GKE or whatever. Love it. So how can, um... Couchbase helps streamline mobile application development in comparison to other cloud data store platforms. Okay, so uh, with Couchbase Capella, uh, so first of all, let me uh, start and say Couchbase does, Couchbase's mobile offering consists of Couchbase Lite, which is a database that can run on uh, devices, so mobile devices and then some embedded devices as well. Uh, and then a sync gateway is the tool that you can use to have those databases synchronize data with your Couchbase server, uh, wh wherever that's running, if it's running on-premises or running in the cloud or what, what have you. Uh, as of right now, I don't believe a sync gateway can run in Couchbase Capella just yet. That is something coming in the future. Um, but I would say, you know, uh, how, how can help streamline mobile application development? That's a very broad question. I, I think one of the things that Couchbase provides that's uh, relatively unique, uh, Couchbase Mobile is offline first capability. So uh, you read and write to a database running uh, on the device, uh, no matter if you have internet connection or not. Uh, and so once you have, you know, if you're, if you're walking around, for instance, in a, let's say a large parking lot, or uh, you're out in the field delivering packages, you may not always have connection. But if you have a Couchbase, write, uh, Couchbase Lite running locally on your device, you can still do reads and writes, and it will synchronize later once you're getting into an, an area where you have connectivity again. Awesome. Uh, so what level of locking? This came in earlier. Sorry, say that again? It says, it says simply, what level of locking? What level of locking? Correct. Oh, are we talking acid transactions? Or, well, not so much acid transactions. I guess um, locking is part of acid transactions, but uh, Couchbase offers locking APIs, uh, opt offers both optimistic and pessimistic locking. Uh, I don't want to get into too much detail there because uh, it's a lot of fun stuff that I'll go on about for hours, but uh, certainly both types of locking are supported in Couchbase. And uh, that is part of the ACID transaction API, but it's behind the scenes. I love it. And do, uh, don't you have to delete the entire document and rewrite it if you're only updating one field? No, I think I covered that. Uh, someone mentioned that in the chat. Uh, certainly not. You can update uh, you know, just a subset, what's called a sub-document API uh, of the document. So if you have large documents, that's a very helpful thing to reduce the amount of uh, waste and overhead and updating, let's say just a Boolean flag, for instance. Uh, 
And what is the performance compared to relational? Yeah, uh, so that, that's a tough question to answer uh, across the board um, because it always depends on use case and how much data you have. I, I will say that one thing that sets apart Couchbase in terms of performance is the built-in caching layer. So you know, lots of times you'll see large scale relational deployments that really wouldn't function very well unless they were integrated with some caching components. With Couchbase, that's built right in. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, that the key value lookup is always going to use that cache uh, which means we're talking microseconds for those operations. Now, when it comes to queries, you know, it's it's hard to say without looking at the queries. Like, I've seen some really gnarly queries out there, and and those can be bad in relational and uh, couch-based world. Um, so, uh, having good indexing is is very important. Um, Couchbase has an index advisor to help you to to suggest indexes that would make your queries faster. And there's other options as well. So Couchbase has a full text search engine built in. Sometimes using that is uh, the faster way to go. The analytics engine uh, for really complex ad hoc queries, that's the better way to go for those. So there's a lot of options for Couchbase in terms of data access. And just speaking about performance in general is kind of hard to do without, without more detail. I love it. So, and if you have questions for Matthew, feel free to submit them in the Q and A portion. It helps me to find them a little bit easier than um, the chat. But let me just going through the chat here a little bit, Matthew. Um, any major attention points when transitioning, uh, as you explained? Any major what points? Uh, any major attention points when transitioning, as you explained? Attention. Uh, okay. Um, you know, I think. Going from relational to a uh, modern database, there's a lot of benefits to it. Uh, if, if you have a, uh, a database that is very heavily uh, stored procedure or trigger, uh, uses a lot of triggers, that's gonna make it uh, more challenging. Uh, Couchbase does have some functionality that can uh, replace those, uh, at least, uh, at least uh, a large part of it uh, with Couchbase eventing and UDFs and uh, um, things like that, but you know, it's it's still going to be very difficult to do that kind of transition uh, if you are very trigger and, and sprock uh, dependent. So that I so said that that would be a major attention point for me. Uh, I'd be I'd be I'd be concerned about that um, if you're looking to get into the transition. Uh, just make sure you have a good strategy for that uh, before you go in. So is it one or multiple databases per cluster? And does cluster equal SQL, or the server and SQL server? Right, that's correct. So uh, when we say uh, databases, my translation there was buckets. So a, a couch base uh, cluster can have multiple buckets. So back over here, you can see I just have the one, but certainly I can add more buckets to this if I want to, if I wanted to put a data diversity bucket, for instance. I can go ahead and do that right here. And I'm just gonna go through the defaults. And there we go. Now I have two buckets. They're in the same cluster though. So this is kind of equivalent to a database or catalog in the relational world. Perfect. And is it possible to document the expected format metadata of the collections documents? Um, the expected format, that's a very interesting way to put it, expected format. Uh, so there is something in Couchbase called uh, infer there is an infer function. And what this does is it will take a sample of the data that you have, and it will give you a, a schema that's been inferred from looking at that data. So if you have a lot of person documents and they all have first name and last name, it's going to consider that to be, you know, generally the, the expected format, I guess, would it be first name and last name, right? But it's not going to enforce that. And that's kind of one of the, the key differences here is that you gain flexibility at, at the cost of in, enforcing, you know, those rigid uh, constraints that you have in the, in the relational world. Now, along those lines, um, we do value, uh, the next question that talks about constraints specifically, we value the relational databases for their constraints on triggers, views, et cetera. How does Couchbase handle that? Right, I already mentioned the triggers um, could, be, could be an issue. As far as views go, um, that, you know, that there's a lot of, uh, it depends on in the views world. Um, there are some things we can do in Couchbase to help with that. As far as constraints though, foreign keys and unique keys, um, you know, with the foreign keys, I, I showed you the, the way uh, that I would embed data uh, that would uh, help with that. So it, it's no longer foreign data, it's now domestic. So there's less of a need for foreign keys there. 
not always, right? But uh, it, it reduces the need. And so a lot of that, uh, a lot of that functionality kind of gets, has to get uh, picked up by the application that consumes it, right? So if you want to enforce something unique, you can do that at the application level. Again, there are some, potentially some workarounds uh, with eventing uh, or with uh, the actual uh, constructing a document key, which is an, an enforced uniquely uh, enforced uniqueness in the document key. Um, but yeah, there's a lots of, it depends there. Um, uh, so, you know, um, something that, again, kind of the earlier question, something to watch for is, uh, it, you know, if a unique uh, constraint is something you rely on completely for the database to provide, um, you know, that's likely causing other problems in your application stack, but it's something that uh, definitely has to be handled by the application. And that's, that's true of almost any, any modern NoSQL database. I love it. Well, that's all the questions um, we have right now. I'll give everyone a little moment here just to enter anything else. As a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides and the recording. So anybody who missed part of the webinar can certainly catch up. Um, anything else, Matthew, you would like to add? Well, really terrific questions, everybody. Thank you for uh, all your uh, discussion and questions. I really appreciate it. Thank you for coming. Well, Matthew, thank you so much again for kicking off the new year with us and to Couchbase for helping sponsor yet another webinar. Just love it. And again, uh, thanks to all of our attendees, as Matthew said, for being so engaged in everything we do. Uh, and hope you all have a great day. Happy New Year. Thanks, everyone.